Welcome everyone. This is the Builders Call. We have a pretty simple agenda. Uh, we're gonna go through kind of a new format and then uh, gonna do some deep dive into Shannon Architecture, uh, talk about some builder possibilities and then uh, open the floor to just discussion. So kicking it off, goals. Uh, pretty easy, none of this is you know really complex. Uh, ultimately our goal is to provide deep dives into relevant uh, protocol topics. Um, and specifically ones that relate to builders. Our goal is when you leave here, you understand things that uh, is going on inside the protocol. You understand things that are going on inside of Shannon so that you can build. This is ultimately about builders. And so we wanna provide the best information for you. Um, so then with that is number two is just provide you with all the best information and updates. Uh, regardless if it's just strictly protocol, if it's also Anything that is relevant to builders, that's what we want to focus on and provide you in these community calls. And then we want to uh, explore grant projects, whether it's existing grants, whether it's upcoming grants. Uh, we want to make it so folks know how to plug into the ecosystem. So to start off with, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about the, I know for myself, I, you know, I've read the, the different blog posts. Uh, I've heard the little tidbits dropped here and there but I didn't feel like I had a real solid understanding of what exactly the Shannon architecture is. And I've really enjoyed being a part of the protocol team uh, and kind of working with them these basically last two going on three weeks now, as it's exposed me to so much more of what's going on behind the scenes. So what I wanna do is just kind of convey what I've been learning in case other people haven't been aware of uh, these kind of finer points of the Shannon architecture so that we can all kind of know where where to focus with this coming Shannon release. So when it comes to the architecture, uh, you have Shannon. But what exactly is Shannon? An important, the most important thing to focus on is that Shannon, it's being built fully Cosmos SDK compatible. Uh, once I learned that, I you know, really started to see where exactly this ecosystem goes. But how the Cosmos SDK works into the larger stack is you have the Cosmos SDK and then kind of a middleware. What Rollkit does is it allows uh, someone that is using the Cosmos SDK to create rollups. Uh, and then those rollups are able then to be deployed to Celestia. So the benefits of this kind of development is uh, the development themselves, the team, they're able to focus on the utility on a well-established framework. Uh, this, the Cosmos SDK, it's a phenomenal ecosystem and we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Uh, and then you have Rollkit, which handles the converting the Cosmos SDK uh, to a rollup for Celestia. And then you have Celestia, which just takes care of all the validation. So with this kind of stack, the protocol team is focused on utility on a well-established framework, and then everything else is taken care of by these other platforms. However, we are finding, uh, the protocol team is actively finding the challenges of this kind of stack. Uh, because while the protocol team is building with the latest and greatest Cosmos SDK version, which is version 0.50, Rollkit uh, is not yet fully compatible with this latest version. So they're actually fully compatible with version 0.47, and they're not yet fully compatible with 0.50. So as so actually currently, this is one of the biggest challenges that the protocol team is, because Rollkit isn't fully compatible yet, they're kind of swarming to figure out how to get it fully compatible and how to get everything properly working so that we can actually deploy to Celestia. Because if Rollkit is, is not compatible with, what, uh, with the version of the SDK that we're operating with, it can't send the rollups again for Celestia. So it literally creates a, a break in the architecture. So as the team, this, this iteration, meaning these next like two weeks, they're just heavily focused on figuring out exactly what is required for this migration to the newest 
Cosmos SDK version, and also identifying you know what alternatives there are in case it's not fully, in case Rollkit isn't able to keep up with what Pocket needs. So I wanted to explain, because I found this fascinating. Once I started to get into how the ecosystem is built, uh, or how Shannon is built, it really started to open my mind to all the contingencies that exist. So let's say uh, this this one on the left, you have the Cosmos SDK. Say Rollkit is going to be behind what Pocket needs. There's actually other platforms that can come in and provide rollups uh, similar to Rollkit. And this is where you have Sovereign Labs. Uh, they're, so, they're another uh, solution that, or that the protocol team has already uh, looked into and considered. And that could literally kind of be a swap and replacement to be able to have this you know, Cosmos on Celestia. Now, you also, Celestia itself, uh, you know, if you go with something like Sovereign Labs, you also then have the possibility of not just only using Celestia, you could potentially use Eigenlayer, uh, what's called EigenDA. So I'm not fully familiar about that, so I can't answer all the questions about, you know, difference between Celestia and Eigen. But what it does is it opens up a lot of possibilities. So even uh, contingencies, and you could actually take out Rollkit and put in something like Sovereign Labs. But then say we don't want to go with another middleware uh, for the rollups. There's always the possibility, and I did not know this, I did not realize this, there's always the possibility of just literally taking Shannon and just deploying our own L1 because it's all based on the Cosmos SDK. So this means that you would just deploy directly Comet uh, BFT, uh, the Comet BFT consensus layer, which is used to be called Tendermint when they, with their latest version, they have changed the name and, and kind of branding from Tendermint to Comet, Comet BFT. So we can always go back to having our own validators because what Celestia provides or what Eigenlayer uh, would provide would be, they take care of this uh, kind of this data availability and this validation side. So we just focus on the utility of uh, how Pocket actually works on the protocol level. And we don't have to worry about the kind of the blockchain layer uh, and validation, but we can always just go ahead and bring validation back to where we have our own L1 and it would be just like any other Cosmos uh, based chain. Uh, and there really isn't any, uh, any difference. The benefit of having something like a rollup uh, the middleware rollup in Celestia is it just offloads the validation uh, and a number of things from not having to be under pocket. But if those other platforms are going to be the hold back pocket, there still is the possibility of just, hey, let's just go ahead and deploy our own uh, our own network. We already have thousands of validators anyways, which is typically a big challenge with new networks is just having enough validators. We already have a lot of validators, so we could just actually go to our own L1. Yeah, so then validation would be in house now instead of being uh, instead of being offloaded to Celestia. So any any, uh, any kind of questions or, or anything of that nature? If we're not our own L one, does it mean that we have to pay? Or sorry, that we will have an L two pocket token, but we'll pay gas fees with an L one native coin? I actually don't I have no clue about that. So uh, like right now with with how it would work with Celestia is uh, you do pay a Celestia fee to have your blocks validated. So, uh, and, and that is paid for by the sequencers. Uh, so you have sequencers, which are uh, kind of built as part of the, uh, the rollup uh, layer, right? You have these sequencers and then, then take the data that needs to be validated uh, and be part of the blockchain and submits it to the Celestia network. And then when that, just like how on any network to have your data validated on that network, you have to pay the, that token. So we wouldn't be using our pocket token for validating. Uh, that's because the validating would happen on Celestia. But most nodes are a few sequencers that would be uh, you know, dealing with the Celestia you know, blockchain. So yes, in terms of there would be there would be another token that you pay the L1 
uh, you would pay in their token, not in the pocket token. Pocket token would strictly be used for utility, not for block confirmations. This is probably not the combo for that, but I'd love a bigger breakdown on it because I, I still don't quite understand. Does that mean that we'd have two tokens? No, what we have one. Ones? So yeah. we have one token that is used for paying for RPC. Okay, so uh, to deal with you know claims and proofs and burning and all that all that jazz, everything dealing with the economics of of uh, using Pocket uses the Pocket token. Where another token would come in in this stack, if we're using Celestia underneath Pocket, then to uh, to get that data to pay the gas fees for that data to be on the Celestia network, you then pay using the Celestia token. And, and that would only be very specific actors. And if you look at rollups, they're known as sequencers. Sequencers are going to be the ones that organize this Celestia blockchain. And those sequencers, uh, it's, it's not like, you know, anyone becomes a sequencer. It's kind of like a set amount of sequencers, you know, would be doing this job on behalf of the pocket network, while the pocket token itself is being used by developers. It's being it's what is uh, you know generating reward for node runners and everything of that nature. The only difference is these few actors known as sequencers. They would have to pay the Celestia fee or whatever the L2 fee is. Uh, imagine uh, okay, so I got another one uh, from Coder here. Uh, imagine L2 tokens such as USDT. You cannot send USDT. Uh, you uh, you also need ETH. For the network gas fee, right? So in this case, you would have C Celestia's coin would be what you pay the gas fees in, um, unless Celestia has some other mechanism. But um, yeah, you would have a few sequencers that would have to have the token of whatever the underlying blockchain is underneath that's doing our validation. Thanks, Shane. Super yeah. helpful. All right. So what this is meant to do is really it's just meant to show you. The main takeaway is that regardless of what the stack looks like, is that Shannon, it's being built fully Cosmos SDK compatible. That's uh, the, the important part here for builders. Uh, the protocol team, again, they're, they're working out this migration issue. They're figuring out, okay, should we continue working on the uh, roll kit side or should we you know, go to a different um, roll up middleware? Uh, or should we, you know, kind of be an L1 where, you know, everything's able to be handled directly through the pocket token? Uh, all that is still being figured out. That doesn't actually stop or hold back really much of Shannon's progress at all because it's all built on the Cosmos SDK, converting from a roll kit uh, based, you know, product on Celestia to just being an L1 is actually a very straightforward process because everything is already on the Cosmos SDK, utilizing Cosmos SDK. So what does this look like in terms of timeline? So the February uh, goal, uh, the goals for February is to finish the, the migration to the latest Cosmos and then to launch an alpha testnet, uh, a closed alpha testnet. This is mainly just to, just to confirm that uh, validation is properly happening and all, all things of that nature. And then uh, finalize deployment tools. Uh, and then March is where things start to open up for builders because there's going to be the launch of a public testnet. Uh, and then the protocol team is going to be focused on Shannon SDK testing uh, and gateway testing. So actually start testing the the actual utility side of the protocol once a public mainnet, uh, mainnet is launched. And so what this means for builders specifically is builders can Shannon tools once the testnet is launched. So we're really hoping next month is when builders can start going ham with uh, building, you know, you, either your existing services or thinking of new services, what have you, uh, utilizing the public test net, which again is all Cosmos SDK based. Uh, I see there's a, a, a question here. Uh, if we launch, uh, if we launch towards L1, 15 chains. Yeah, this is talking about max chains. Yeah, max chains would would be. It'll be different in Shannon than, than currently how it is, what it initially looks like. And we're going to be releasing more information. I'm actually helping work on kind of the migration plan and the migration strategy from uh, in the parity strategy of Morse to Shannon. So we're actually going to be releasing stuff this month, which everyone will be able to look at and see what is really the, the difference between Morse and Shannon in terms of the economics. But 
going back to my slide, uh, builder possibilities. Really, at the end of the day, builders, all you need to keep in mind is the Cosmos SDK because we now are compatible with a world of tools that are all built off the Cosmos SDK. So this means that we can be integrated immediately, basically into wallets. Uh, there's all sorts of explorers that are already built for the Cosmos SDK, bridges, et cetera. So anything you can really, most any ecosystem would work and can be used inside of Pocket now. Um, before, Pocket was, was very hard to build with. Um, it was, it was, there was a significant learning curve when you needed to build with, with Morse. Uh, and that's because we were then this fork of Cosmos, and then we didn't progress with the ecosystem. But now we're actually, we're going to be part of that same stream. So anything that exists with inside a pocket. And so, you know, a good example here is something like Explorers. Uh, I know in the forum, there's been talk about, you know, having an open source Explorer. And part of the challenge was, is there was just such a significant learning curve with Morse to getting all the right data, operating inside of this old, very old version of Tendermint and all this stuff. However, there's a lot of open source explorers that are already Cosmos SDK compatible. And so plugging Pocket into these other explorers or launching your own explorer with modifications that are Pocket focused, uh, but using the base of one of these other open source explorers, there's a lot of cool possibilities there. So this basically means Shannon is very approachable. And uh, with the test net, uh, coming up in March, there's going to be a lot of cool opportunity. And so we're hoping folks will really take the initiative. Uh, PNF is already expecting to have, you know, grants start becoming available after public testnet. And uh, kind of with that, uh, kind of the focus of grants is to start focusing and start shifting focus to Shannon versus Morse. So uh, grants that are specifically focused on Morse work, uh, they're going to be phased out, which you'll You'll probably see in the coming uh, in the coming weeks, uh, but then grants, uh, but then and you know Shannon uh, grants, which again because Sh Shannon's built built off the Cosmos SDK, opens up a lot of possibilities. And then quick grants, also known as sockets, uh, they will be a great way for new projects to get started. So we're really excited to see what starts to happen in the uh, in the coming future because there's a a lot a, a whole new world of possibilities are opening up through the uh, Shannon being built with the Cosmos SDK. Yeah, any questions, uh, any thoughts? Yeah, I've got a couple quick ones. The first one is just around the version of Cosmos SDK. Was there a super um, compelling reason that the team wanted to build on the latest Cosmos SDK despite the version mismatch with Rollkit or like the support mismatch with Rollkit? Like, are there any super compelling features or functionalities in that latest version that they really want to have available for Shannon? Uh, I don't believe there was like, oh man, we have to do this because of the newest feature. Uh, the big difference uh, between 45 and 50 in the versioning was actually quite large though. It was a, a very large update that actually changed how uh, modules work uh, inside of Cosmos. So Cosmos is built to be modular literally the foundation of, of the value of the Cosmos SDK. Well, this version dramatically changed modules. So I don't know if that, or if that version has some kind of feature that Shannon needed. I don't think it had something that Shannon needed, quote unquote, but it is a significant change in the, in the, uh, in the ecosystem and all this work. So the, so they've been building using the latest but it's just not compatible with something like Rollkit. And there's, at least right now, there's there's no timeline on when it will be made available, right? So that's always the risk when you have a middleware inside of your stack, because if they don't upgrade, you're kind of, you're kind of stuck. Now, we're not stuck because we could always migrate to our own chain or migrate somewhere else, but making those kind of changes is, you know, it's easy to do it before Shannon launches, but it'd be very complex and convoluted to do that regularly after Shannon is launched and after we already have a mainnet, right? So that's why right now we could actually move quickly between, oh, let's just go from Orchid to something else uh, or even do our own L1. We can do that really quickly. Doing that once mainnet exists and launches, oof, that's, that's no easy undertaking. So that's the reason the team is very focused right now on 
feeling out what dependency on these platforms would uh, would create in the long term for Pocket. Got it. That makes a ton of sense. Thank you. Hey, folks, uh, if I may, I want to double down on the uh, documentation parts. You mentioned a little bit more documentation is coming, but we really need you know, even more and more documentation on the architecture, what's going to change for node runners, for stakers, for investors, for all the different actors. And, you know, what, what are the changes uh, as far as the operations go from uh, V0 to V1? Uh, imagine we are making a consensus breaking proposal uh, for V0, right? Imagine the scrutiny that we are going through. This is mother of all, you know, consensus breaking changes. This is a complete rewrite of everything and new approaches, new tokenomics, perhaps. Uh, we need to start discussing those. This call here is really nice, but this is online, right? And how many people are here? Maybe, maybe 20 people. Uh, we need to open this up to the ecosystem so people can read, think, give feedback. And we need to do those before it is uh, too late, right? We don't want to be in the case that Oh, should we completely miss that? But too bad we already wrote everything and now we are locked into this. You know, we wish we, you know, heard this feedback uh, sooner. So when do you think that can happen? Or is there anyone actually working on that? Yeah, actually, I can say that I a, a good part of my uh, uh, week was was actually kind of going through the migration or the parity, the parity check between Shannon and and Morse, right? Morse to Shannon. So that's actually a huge part of what I'm kind of working on right now. I'm starting to get acclimated with kind of the protocol with all the resources that they have because they they did a basic, they did a very basic uh, kind of breakdown of Shan of Morse to Shannon and what you know what features are carrying over, which ones aren't missing. And part of that was because it takes someone who you know, is actively involved in the protocol like myself that understands all the different stakeholders in a more intimate level. So I actually already identified a number of areas that were missing. So what I'm trying to do right now is kind of get everything together um, into a, a either a single, you know, a single source or a few sources, but get everything together. And then the whole idea is none of this is moving forward with like, and allowing folks to be engaged and be involved in the discussions uh, with with how this migration or how this parity would be in terms of future parity, so and how it affects different stakeholders. So all of that is absolutely going to be uh, be shared. That's actively what I'm kind of doing right now. I'm still getting my you know getting my full bearing and and literally consuming insane amount of information right now, <laughs> like trying to get it all sorted. But that, that's part of the reason why they wanted to bring me on is because I do have a very good understanding of all the different stakeholders inside the Pocket ecosystem, uh, having built in a number of the different verticals myself. So uh, they just needed someone that had that ability to look at all these different stakeholders, identify where there might be gaps because the developers themselves, they're just looking, oh, okay, yes, this, uh, this is Morris, this is Shannon, and but not realizing what that effect would create. So yeah, I'm... I'm putting myself a little bit on the spot here in terms of that's one of my big focuses right now. And we hope to this iteration, so like in the next two weeks, uh, re start releasing this kind of information that people can look at. Uh, and there, I think there's probably going to be some decisions that the DAO is going to have to make. Like, okay, what uh, if we don't have this or if, it, if this looks a little that okay, how does that affect the ecosystem? And there's going to be decisions that are going to have to be made. So I completely agree with you there, Coda. Thank you. Um, and and also part of my myself being uh, uh, kind of joining the team in this you know kind of outsider involved in these calls as well. So this is a good way to also get more information. And and any of the community calls, folks are welcome to ask questions. Uh, and I'll just let you know where we're at right now, kind of where we're at with that particular question. So yeah, feel free to to keep asking. Shane, can I? Um, I'm going to just take another step here. I I think that what we're saying too is that building tools for Pocket can also put you in a position where you're building tools for the rest of the Cosmos ecosystem, right? So like to extrapolate it, if there are other like retro PGF rounds and other things that are happening within that ecosystem, we're now eligible for that. Is that correct? I believe, you know, I believe so. 
I mean, if you're building something with the Cosmos SDK in mind, I mean, it depends on what exactly you're building, right? Uh, I mean, because like, say, let's take the uh, Explorer, for an example. Uh, if you're building an Explorer that's, that's you know, similar to something like Pocket Scan, there's going to be a lot of information there that isn't necessarily going to translate to other, um, other ecosystems. Uh, because Pocket is so strictly a utility, uh, we have a lot of different type of data um, than what most have. So, uh, so maybe something that's built in Pocket doesn't necessarily translate because it's so tailored to Pocket, but things that that are general in terms of, uh, you know, there could actually be some node deployment or, or node staking tools or things of that nature, what have you that that people build or wallets, right? Uh, actually, you know, node wallet, which is what we built for Morse, well, so we can easily add uh, the Cosmos SDK to it to make it Shannon compatible. But, you know, Pocket will technically be ready to work in all these other uh, wallets as well. Now, they might not have features that will be in Node Wallet where, you know, a provider can just say, hey, stake with us and just boom, everything. Uh, they just have a button on their uh, on their website and you just immediately stake with them through a button. You know, there, there's certain things that might, that will probably be in Node Wallet that will not be in these other wallets. But there is a huge amount of transferability in terms of if it works for Pocket, it works for these other ecosystems. So yeah, that, that's a real possibility. Someone could kind of build something and have it be Pocket focused um, or, or build something for Pocket, but then it could actually be utilized with inside all these other ecosystems. And there, there might be all sorts of ways to get grants, yeah, across these different ecosystems um, if they, uh, uh, you know, with, with a product that's kind of built inside Pocket, very possible.